Well, Father, we just thank you for this time that we can come together in your word. And, and Lord, as always, we just ask that you would be our teacher. We know that your word is not of any private interpretation, Lord, but it is revealed to us by your Holy Spirit who gives us understanding. So, Father, we submit ourselves to him this morning to learn from him. Lord, we submit ourselves to you to be led by you. And so, Father, this morning, I just pray for each of my brothers and sisters who are at home uh, as part of this fellowship this morning. I pray that you would be uh, watching over them and keeping them. Lord, I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would transform our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Um, well, last week, guys, Paul had come to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost and we saw last week that uh, when he gets there, he goes and he meets with James, the brother of the Lord. And, and we saw how uh, James informs him that, you know, there's been these rumors going around about you, Paul, that you've been encouraging <clears throat> the Jewish believers to abandon their faith. And, and of course, those are false rumors. And so James has a plan uh, to dispel the rumors because he hears from Paul all the, the, the fantastic things that the Lord and the Holy Spirit have done in planting the churches throughout uh, Asia Minor and, and Achaia and, and uh, Greece and Macedonia and, and how Paul has used him there. And, and so, you know, here's the plan that James comes up with. You know, he says, um, go and take these, I got these four guys that, that they've been keeping their vow, they're Jews, they're devout Jews. And, and they're believers, and I want you to take them to the temple to complete their vow, as you also are. And he says, and when you go, pay their expenses for their offerings and so on, and, and uh, that will show your goodwill and your support for them in, in keeping the covenant of their fathers. And so, you know, so this is the, the plan <clears throat> that James has to dispel some of these rumors. Well, the Asian Jews who have also been pursuing Paul for much of his missionary career and trying to kill him have also come to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. So um, while they are there, they see Paul in the temple. And so they stir up the other Jews against Paul. And so then this mob that they stir up apprehends Paul. So um, we'll pick it up now in verse 27. It says, now when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, men of Israel, help. This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, and this place. And further, he also brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. <clears throat> For they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian with him in the city, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And all the city was disturbed, and the people ran together, seized Paul, and dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. So Trophimus now had joined Paul in Ephesus, and when we look at verse 28 here, we see the accusation that they seem to be most fired up about here, or at least this is the one that they're using, is that he brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. Well, let's talk about that for a minute. The phrase holy place is only used by three different New Testament authors. Uh, authors. It's uh, used by Matthew as he quotes Jesus in Matthew 24, and, and it's there where he, uh, Jesus is, is talking about the signs that will take place, the signs of his coming, and, and he says, when you see the abomination of Dan desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, um, you know, let the reader understand, you know, so it's, it's there that this holy place, the Greek there, the word is Hagios topos, two words. Hagios meaning holy or set apart, and, and topos uh, meaning a geographic location. It's where we get the, the word topography. If you've ever learned to navigate with a map and compass, you know what I'm talking about. If you use a GPS, you have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, but uh, the, the, uh, but it, it, it's the way Matthew words it is the holy place with a definite article there. Now, the, the writer of Hebrews uses the word hagion instead of hagios topos. 
and it's to speak of the holy place that is part of the temple immediately outside of the Holy of Holies where the ark is inside the Holy of Holies, the, the two large cherubim and the, and the gold menorah, and it's in the holy place where you have the incense altar and, and the table of the showbread. And, and so when uh, we look at Hebrews, Hebrews is talking about the holy place, a specific place inside of the temple. Now, Luke uses the phrase, this hagios topos, and he uses it twice. He uses it here in chapter 21, and then also in Acts chapter 16, verse 13, as Stephen is being accused, because it, it says there that they also set up false witnesses who said, this man, speaking of Stephen, does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. Now, the phrase as, you, uh, as Luke uses it seems to refer to, the, uh, to, at the very least, the temple precincts that were off limits to the Gentiles. Now, if we were to look at, at the layout of the temple, the outermost court was the court of the Gentiles. And this is a place where Gentiles who had become proselytes could go. That's as far as they could go. The Jews basically had no respect for the Gentile proselytes, and so they used it as their marketplace. That was the court of the Gentiles. Well, the next court going in was the court of the women. Now, of course, this would be not all women. It would be only the Jewish women. Now, further in was the court or, or was the, the temple where only Jewish males could go. So um, now before you went from the court of the Gentiles into the court of the women, there was a, a sign in Latin and Greek on the wall in letters about three feet tall which read, no foreigner may enter within the barricade which surrounds the temple and enclosure. Anyone who is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his ensuing death. Now, it was only in uh, Hebrew, I mean, uh, not in Hebrew, it was in uh, Latin and Greek. And the, only, and the reason it was is because it was common knowledge to the Jews and they could go in there. It was a, a prohibition aimed at the Gentiles. And, and so that's uh, why it was that way. Well, Although the Romans had taken capital punishment away from the Jews by this time, they allowed them to exercise the right of execution if anyone, including a Roman citizen, violated this regulation in the temple because it was so deeply ingrained in the Jewish culture. So, you know, this is, this is the one thing that the Jews actually could put somebody to death for under the Roman rule. Well, Paul uses this wall of separation between the court of the women uh, or the court of the Gentiles and the court of the women um, when he writes to the Ephesians. And, and um, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse uh, 11 through 16, you can turn there if you like, otherwise I'll just read. But it says, therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, this, this wall between the court of the Gentiles and the court of the women, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. So the gospel took away the figurative wall that had shut the Gentiles out of God's kingdom. Now, when we look today at religion, religion seeks to rebuild that wall. Now, sometimes it uses the original building blocks. Sometimes it uses new building blocks. Now, the old building blocks would be things like keeping the Sabbath, 
keeping the feasts, keeping fad diets based on Old Testament dietary laws, or otherwise Judaizing oneself. You know, I know a lot of times for some reason there seems to be various factions in Christianity who are made up of Gentiles who want to be Jews so bad that they start adopting Jewish traditions. Well, the new building blocks that uh, the wall sometimes gets rebuilt with are things like liturgy. In other words, you know, the, the, your, your particular ritual in worship, you know, how many songs you do before the message, how many songs you do before, you know, whatever. Um, the, the, just a, the order of service, certain rules, that's your liturgy. Um, dress code can be one. Uh, you know, I know, I know some churches you'll about get kicked out of if you're not uh, wearing a suit, and others you'll about get kicked out of if you're not wearing a Hawaiian shirt. Um, but, um, you know, those are a couple of things. Frowning on how some choose to educate their children can be some of the building blocks. I mean, I've, I've seen in churches where um, homeschooling was frowned upon. I've seen where homeschooling ha homeschoolers have frowned on Christian schools and, and Christian schools has frowned on public schools. So it's, it's like rock, paper, scissors all over. So these are some of the things. Um, some will say, I, I won't even take aspirin because that's drugs. I, I'm a firm believer in no pain, no pain. Um, vaccines or another, or certain foods, you know. So, so there are things that we can turn into a legalism which become the new building blocks of, of religion. We have to remember that we are not under the law, but under grace as part of the new covenant. Now, Trophimus is not a proselyte here. Um, he did not become a Jew in order to become a Christian. That would have gone against everything Paul had been sharing. Now, keep in mind that the Asian Jews spotted Trophimus in the city rather than in the temple, or for that matter, he's not even in the court of the Gentiles. So he would have been allowed to go into the court of the Gentiles, provided he was a Jew, but he's not there. But they see Paul in the temple, who is a Jew, and presume that Paul had taken this same Trophimus into the temple. And so this whole accusation is based on presumption. But it's a convenient presumption for them. And they're going to use it. Now, if this, <clears throat> excuse me, if this accusation were true, this would have been a serious enough offense that uh, Paul could be executed for this. He could be taken out and stoned to death. Now, Trophimus is not even present at this point. It is Paul and the four guys that have gone with him to pay their vows. So this is, is who's there when, when Paul is arrested. So Paul ends up getting drug out of the temple. They shut the temple door behind them, and then they begin to beat Paul. You know, and, and, and it's, it's like, this poor man, He's been beaten so many times. But you know what they say, if you can't join them, beat them. Um, well, okay, maybe that's not how the saying goes, but it fits here, so I'm going to stick with my version. Uh, verse 31, now as they were seeking to kill him, news came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the commander of the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains. And he asked who he was and what he had done. So this is a riot now that is breaking out. And, and so the commander of the garrison takes with him centurions, plural. Now centurions um, commanded a hundred soldiers. The commander was over 10 centurions. Now, so it's possible that he took as many as a thousand soldiers with him. Only two flights of stairs away from the court of the Gentiles is the Tower of Antonia, uh, where 500 Roman soldiers were stationed at a time. So this commander, though, as he sees what's going on here, believes Paul to be somebody who is is other than who he is, and we'll talk about his identity later, but it's, he's viewed right now as though he is public enemy number one of the Jews, and in the Roman mind, that's a different person for them than it is for the Jews. Okay, verse 34, 
Um, so, and some among the multitude cried one thing and some another, so that when he could not ascertain the truth because of the tumult, he commanded him to be taken into the barracks. When he reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob, and the multitude of the people followed after, crying away with him. So the Jews were ready to snag Paul out of the hands of the Romans to kill him. So basically, they picked him up and they carried him. And, and so he's bound with two chains right now. You know, and the way I kind of picture that is not the right way. You know, I kind of picture him, you know, wrapped up in a couple of chains. But this would mean that he was bound by chains to two Roman soldiers. So he's bound between them. And so, you know, this, this, uh, this man that they have, they assume is... is um, you know, a somebody else uh, is actually a man of poor physical condition and small stature. So, you know, you kind of get the picture. Here's a couple of Roman soldiers that have this, you know, this little guy bound between them. And uh, so, you know, it's it really seems to be way over the top for for what Paul is being accused of. Now, not unlike Passover, when Jesus was crucified, at this point, the city is swollen with Jews who have come from all over the world for the feast. So there's a, a very large mob there. And so, you know, much to the commander's credit, though, when this tumult breaks loose here, the commander doesn't just let him, uh, you know, let them take Paul and, and, and beat him to death or, or stone him or whatever they want to do. Um, he wants to get a hold of Paul to find out who he is because if, if he is who he thinks he is, this isn't a matter for the Jews to settle. This is more a matter for the Roman government to settle. Verse 37 says, Then as Paul was about to be led into the barracks, he said to the commander, May I speak to you? Well, he said it in Greek. He replied, Can you speak Greek? Are you not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a rebellion and led the 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness? So as Paul addresses the commander, you know, I think he's, he's not expecting to, to hear Greek, and I don't think he's expecting to hear Hebrew either. I, you know, I think he's expecting to, to hear, you know, whatever language the Egyptians were speaking at that point. I'm not sure if it would be the Gaes or, or what, what it would be, but that's what he's expecting to hear. And, and so when he speaks to him in Greek, he's going, wait a minute, you're not who I thought you were. And, and so, you know, I don't know, you know, maybe he thought that Paul was an Egyptian because he walked like an Egyptian. Who knows? Um, now, you know, you guys are, are probably going to have this song stuck in your head the rest of your day. You're welcome. Um, the Egyptians, uh, or this Egyptian rather, uh, is also mentioned by Josephus. He led this army of 4,000 men to the Mount of Olives where he declared that they were going to take over the Temple Mount. And so the Roman soldiers quickly scattered them and their leader, the Egyptian, managed to successfully evade being captured. So this is who they thought he was. You know, they thought he was a this fugitive. Well, uh, goes on in, in verse 39, it says, But Paul said, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city, and I implore you, permit me to speak to the people. So when he had given permission, Paul stood on the stairs and motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, saying, and we'll pause there for a minute. And so Paul is is only identifying himself as a, a citizen of Tarsus in Cilicia at this point. He, he's not really declaring anything more about himself yet. But um, his residency of that city was enough for the commander, though, to allow him to try to address the Jews. He, you know, he kind of looked at that and said, like, oh, you're, you're not from bug tussle, you know, wherever. Um, he, uh, he allows him to speak. And so as a citizen of Tarsus... He could not be the suspected Egyptian. And uh, so Tar uh, Tarsus 
was a well-regarded city in the Roman Empire. In fact, it was almost as highly regarded as the city of Rome itself in its importance. Now, I get the impression that both Paul and the commander hoped that by Paul addressing the people, he could calm them down and, and bring things back under control. Well, amazingly, when, when Paul requests uh, that the crowd quiet by hand gestures um, so that he could speak, the crowd actually complies. They quiet down. And, um, you know, this is, this is a little better for him than it went in Ephesus. You know, when they, they shouted him down, you know, great is Artemis of the Ephesians for two hours, you know. Well, when we look at this now, enough years have passed that this crowd of Jews in Jerusalem, for the most part, seemed to either be unaware of who Paul was, um, or they'd been unaware, or they were unaware of what he had been in the past. In any event, it, they, they don't really seem to recognize who he is. It had been 20 years since Paul had met Jesus on the road to Damascus, and so, you know, he's, he's been gone, for the most part, the better part of that time. Now, the only thing that the crowd had to go uh, on in regard to understanding who Paul was, was the accusation of the Asian Jews against him. You know, where they said, this is the guy that is causing all the trouble up north. Well, to the surprise of the crowd, instead of addressing them in Greek, he addresses them in Hebrew, which shows that the crowd really didn't know much about Paul. This evidently caught them off guard and, and prompted them to listen to what he had to say. Now, uh, chapter 22 is going to give us Paul's defense to the Jews, which is also his testimony. So, um, verse 1, let's pick it up there, chapter 22. Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you. And when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. Then he said, I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous towards God as you all are today. Now, Paul begins his address calling them brethren and fathers. And so by calling them brethren, basically he's saying, look, I'm, I'm a fellow Jew. I'm one of you. And by saying fathers, He's showing that he respects the authority of the Jewish leaders. And so, um, you know, this is, this is how he begins. And, and, and he gives two key details about himself in his address here. He's, first of all, he's a Roman citizen, uh, well, a, a citizen of Cilicia, which gives him certain legal rights. And then he drops Gamaliel's name. And although he was born outside Israel, he was educated and raised in Jerusalem. And so as a Jew, his education at the feet of the great Gamaliel earned him a degree of respect among the other Jews. So, you know, now they're going to listen to him because this is a student of Gamaliel. Well, his testimony is that he was given a strict education in the law, meaning that, that he was, uh, it was a conservative in his Jewish doctrine. He wasn't just raised in the law. He was zealous for God and for his law. So Paul identifies with the crowd by commenting that, that hey, you guys are also zealous, you know, and I, I'm zealous just like you. I, I was just like you guys. And he goes on in verse 4. It says, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest bears me witness in all the counsel of the elders from whom I also received letters to the brethren and went to Damascus to bring in chains, even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. So it appears right now that the high priest and the elders are, are present as he's saying this. And so, you know, and, and as he, he begins this, he says, you know, I used to look at matters of faith exactly as you now see them. And so he's speaking, though, about these things in the past tense, meaning he no longer believes this. And so, you know, when he shares this information, it would have prompted really the most important questions. If this man was zealous for the law, what has changed? And what is he zealous for now? Well, he's about to explain all that. 
And so this is going to be Paul's defense, and it's his testimony of his conversion. And so there, there are, and, and when we look at the details in this conversion, these are familiar details to us because Paul's testimony is recorded several places in the New Testament. Um, now, for the Jews there that day, this was likely the first time they had either heard of Paul or else they had wondered what had become of Saul of Tarsus 20 years earlier. So, you know, he was kind of a memory at that point. Now, he probably wasn't much of a memory, and, and for those that remember, wasn't a good memory. Now, traditionally, if a Jewish man left Judaism, his family regarded him as dead, disinherited him, and held a funeral for him. Now, in the past, he had been Gamaliel's brightest star student. Gamaliel said that he could not keep young Saul in books because he devoured them so quickly. Now, the Mishnah says of Gamaliel that when Rabon, that's like great rabbi, when Rabon Gamaliel died, the law and holiness died with him. You know, so this is how highly regarded and respected Gamaliel was. Well, young Saul was his protege. And so Saul's conversion to Christianity was likely somewhat of a stain on this highly respected teacher's reputation. So they didn't likely talk much about Saul after that, especially after his funeral. However, the high priest and the council of elders were likely around when Saul was making havoc of the church simply by matter of their age and would certainly have remembered who he was. Now, over the past 20 years, Paul had experienced a, enough uh, life and hard mileage that they possibly didn't recognize him at first. You know, I, I don't know, maybe sometime, you know, maybe you've known somebody that you haven't seen for several years and, and they had a really hard several years and, and, um, and they didn't, you didn't recognize them. Um, I had a, a friend that used to be a police officer in Santa Fe and, and Santa Fe was one of those places that a lot of people, a lot of the rich people and the movie stars would, would go as kind of their playground. They, they loved Santa Fe. So you'd see a lot of movie stars there. Well, I had this, this police officer friend who was working downtown one day, and he saw a, a famous starlet, and I won't mention her name for her sake. And uh, she was kind of considered one of the most beautiful stars in Hollywood. And he went up to her, and he said, excuse me, but are you so-and-so? And she said, well, yeah, but I'm just shopping, so I kind of really don't want that to get out. And he said, okay. Well, and, and uh, he said, you used to be so beautiful. What happened? <laughs> he, he wasn't known for not speaking his mind. <laughs> and she said, well, the years have been kind of hard. Well, you know, this starlet later died of cancer. Um, but just the, the point of the story is if, if you know, Paul probably didn't look like that that young promising Jewish scholar, this young Pharisee that they had seen 20 years earlier. Now, um, but when we look back on who we were before Christ, like Saul is doing, one day we might look back in sorrow over what a sinner we were. Another day, we might look back and rejoice over what Jesus had saved us from. Because both are parts of our testimony. Well, Paul continues in verse 6 with the details of his conversion. Now it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon, suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid. But when they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. So I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, arise and go into Damascus. And there you will be told all things which are appointed for you to do. And since I could not see for the glory of that light being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came into Damascus. So every time Paul shares his testimony in Scripture, the details are a little bit different. Not because the facts have changed or, you know, because he's, he's embellishing the story, 
but he deemed some of the details relevant to some audiences, but not to others. The facts of his conversion never changed. Just the audience changed. So the nature of his testimony is this. Verse 6, he had an encounter with a great light from heaven. That was God. Verse 7, a voice from heaven confronted his sin. That was also God. Verse 8, Paul recognized Jesus as God. Verse 9, his experience was personal rather than collective. Verse 10, Paul submitted to the Lord's plan for his life. Verse 11, that experience changed his life. So these details that he gives here are an example of how to share our personal testimony of how we came to Christ. Now, looking at verse 10, if I would have been Paul, when I asked the question, what shall I do, Lord? I would have been expecting an answer more like, I want you to go into Arabia for three years and then back to Tarsus. While you are there, I want you to go back through the scriptures and learn to see me in them. After that, Barnabas will come and find you and take you to Antioch. Then I will send you with a letter into Asia Minor, etc., etc., etc. But what is the answer that Jesus gave Paul? Arise and go to Damascus. Step one. So it'd be like if you gave your life to the Lord tonight for the first time and you said, Lord, what do you want me to do? I want you to go to bed and go to sleep. That's, that's what this was like. And he tells him, you know, and in, in the morning, then I'll tell you what's next. So he basically tells Paul, go to Damascus, step one, then I will give you step two. Now, if Jesus would have given Paul more than one step, Paul would have been walking according to a vision and a plan that was laid out for him. Now, when you only take the, uh, know the next step and take it, that is called walking by faith. You know, there has been an expectation of church leaders now for a while to have a vision and to share the vision with others, you know, and that sharing the vision is often referred to as vision casting. That's the buzz phrase today. And of course, this vision casting involves, you know, not only having your big plan, but laying out the plan that supports the vision. You know, here's how I'm going to do it. Here's how I'm going to accomplish this plan. Well, having a vision ultimately comes down to my vision for Jesus' church. How would you feel if somebody else had a vision and a plan for your family that wasn't Jesus. Well, that's kind of what happens a lot of times when we come up with these big visions. Now, have you ever considered that the word vision is just another word for sight? Well, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, that we are to walk by faith and not by sight. Now, once a month, our, our leadership gathers for a planning and communication meeting. Well, at, at least we did up in, until our current situation. Well, and that is, is where we scheduled upcoming calendar events such as weddings, maintenance projects, anniversary services, joint services with the Spanish ministry, um, and that sort of thing. Um, in other words, events in the building. And, and it wasn't so much that we said, we got to do this, let's plan this. It, it, you, we would just put together the schedule, basically. And we don't do it as part of a bigger vision, but we do it in order to eliminate scheduling conflicts within the building. Well, at the beginning of the year, it became evident early on that this was going to be the busiest year in our building to date. We were already recognizing the plans all the way up into September. Well, now, not so much. Clearly, the Lord had other plans. Now, when, when we as humans lay out the big vision, it tends to become a false god. If the Holy Spirit interrupts us and wants us to abandon this big vision altogether we tend to dismiss his leading away from the vision as our own doubt. 
And then we stop listening to the Holy Spirit and we push forward with our own plan because it, it has, at least in our minds, uh, gone past the point of no return. And, you know, it, it kind of becomes, well, now if we stop, people are just going to think, you know, that, that, you know, we're just being loopy here and, and that we're flighty. Well, Paul certainly had visions, but he was not tied to the vision. Instead, he only had faith. And so that should be an example to us of, of how to walk by faith. And, and you know, and, and it's like, you know, the scripture says that, you know, don't say I'm going to do this and this such and this and such tomorrow, but if the Lord wills, because we, we have to stay submissive to the Lord's will and to the Lord's leading. All right, verse 12, it goes on. It says, then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me. And he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour, I looked up at him. Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you, that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witnesses to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now what are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord. So we know from Acts 9 that, that Saul was taken into Damascus to, to the house of a disciple named Judas, and the, the, the Lord had also spoken to Ananias and, and said, I, you know, I've given your name to Saul in a vision, and you need to go uh, to, to this house of, of Judas and, and uh, pray for him to receive his sight, restore his sight to him. And so at first Ananias told the Lord that he had heard how many harmful things Saul had done to the church and how he had authority from the chief priest to arrest and drag both men and women back to Jerusalem to be tried and possibly even killed. Well, in, in Acts chapter 9, this is Paul's conversion. And starting in verse 15, it says, But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine. This is the Lord speaking to Ananias. He is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So Saul has his eyesight restored is filled with the Holy Spirit, and somewhere in that time, not sure of the order, Ananias reveals to Saul what the Lord's calling for Saul is, or at least he confirms it to him. Now, there's a, a difference between calling and vision. Vision requires a plan. Calling requires obedience. Calling is about what, uh, what God is doing rather than what I intend to do for God. You know, there are times when God will give us a slightly bigger picture of what he is doing, such as planting a church, but he never gives us the full picture. If we think God has given us the full picture, then we are either not leaving room for the Holy Spirit to work or to lead, or else we are placing restrictions and limitations on the Holy Spirit and what he might want to do. I don't want to limit what the Holy Spirit might do by establishing my own grand vision because my grand vision, however big it is, is not going to be nearly as big as what the Lord can do. When Paul writes to the Corinthians in chapter 4, uh, 1 Corinthians, he tells them that uh, it is required in stewards to have vision. No, that's not what he says. He says that stewards are to be faithful, faithful. To walk by faith. Ministers are not leaders so much as they are to be servant stewards. And that's not just talking to pastors. That's talking to anybody who serves the Lord in any capacity in the church. As now it happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I was in a trance and, and saw him saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. So I said, Lord, 
they know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believe on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. So after Paul's conversion... He knew that he was not going to be received by the church at Jerusalem because of all the harm he'd brought on the church. And as Paul is giving his testimony now to this crowd, it's only been a few days since he's been in Philip's house. And as you'll recall, he was one of the seven original deacons and a co-laborer of this same Stephen. And I'm wondering if, if those few days, Paul had been thinking more about that day and about Stephen and as he's giving this detail, thinking about Philip and the pain that he must have caused him and the five other deacons over the murder of their friend. You know, and I think Paul is expressing to the crowd here his deep remorse over his actions against Stephen. But he's sharing all of this to say, I was exactly where you are, but God sent me far from here. In verse 21, he says, then he said to me, Depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. Gentiles, Paul just dropped the G-bomb on the crowd. Verse 22, and they listened to him until this word, and then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. You know, if just bringing up the, the word Gentile was all it needed all was needed to get them to stop listening at this point. So I guess there were two words that you dare not say when you're in Jerusalem. You don't say Yahweh and you don't say Gentile, at least at this time. And as soon as Paul uttered the word Gentile, the crowd had heard all they were willing to hear and they lost their minds. Verse 23, then as they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust into the air, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks and said, that he should be examined under scourging so that he might know why they shouted so against him. So, you know, these are just tearing off the clothes and throwing the dust into the air. You know, this sort of behavior is, is what is known as pre-attack cues. In other words, there's some definite body language going on here that there's about to be a lynching. So the commander is suspicious that... This, these extremely irate Jews are ready to kill this guy and it's disproportionate to what they're entitled to do. So this commander is thinking, okay, there's more to this story than I'm getting here and the only way I'm going to get it is to beat it out of him. So the commander decides that the one way or another, he's going to get to the bottom of this. So Paul is going to be interrogated by scourging. Now remember that this is the same type of scourging that Jesus received with the cat of nine tails. So when you, you think about this, if they scourge Paul, there's basically one of two outcomes here, or anybody. If he's guilty of something, he's going to confess it early on so that they'll stop the, the scourging, but that still might not save his life. Or the other is that Paul is going to hold out and hold to the truth, but they're going to keep scourging him because they're not getting any more information and he's going to get scourged to death. So, you know, this is, this is Paul's fate at this moment if something doesn't change. Well, in verse 25, it says, As they bound him with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard that, he went and told the commander, saying, take care what you do, for this man is a Roman. So Paul just played his ultimate trump card here. He informs the centurion, who was assigned to interrogate him, that he is a Roman citizen, not just a, a citizen of Tarsus. Now, one of the benefits of being a Roman citizen was protection from scourging and from unjust punishment. If a Roman official had a Roman scourged, the official would likely be put to death in his place. So the centurion stops in his tracks, and he goes and tells the commander, who was his superior, and he tells him in so many words, Sir, I need to give you a heads up here. This man claims to be a, a Roman citizen, so I didn't scourge him. I stopped the whip. So this centurion just saved the commander's life. Well, verse 27, he goes on, it says, Then the commander came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman? He said, yes. 
The commander answered, with a large sum, I obtained this citizenship. And Paul said, but I was born a citizen. Then immediately, those who were about to examine him withdrew from him. And the commander was also afraid after he found out that he was a Roman and because he had bound him. Now, in earlier times, in order to be a Roman citizen, you had to be a city of the, or a citizen of the city of Rome itself. Eventually, other cities were allowed to have Roman status as long as they had a Roman official living in that city. So they could basically carry the, the right to extend Roman citizenship with them. Well, Claudius, who is Caesar at this point, began selling citizenship to line his pockets. And others gained their citizenship by doing huge favors for him as well. So we will find out in the next chapter that this commander's name is Claudius Lysias. He added the name Claudius. Uh, he was born Lysias uh, before he purchased his citizenship. And he added the name Claudius to honor Claudius Caesar, who gave him his citizenship. Well, Lysias purchased his citizenship and is undoubtedly wondering how this ramshackled Jew with nothing but the clothes on his back afforded the citizenship. Well, Paul informs him that he was a natural born Roman citizen. Citizens were given a document which declared their, their citizenship. They were these uh, papers, basically. And, and Paul probably had his papers with him as proof of his citizenship, probably pulled them out and showed him the papers. And um, that, <clears throat> of course, we see scared the commander. Well, evidently, Paul's family had been part of a colony which had been granted citizenship and had done favors in order to get their citizenship. So, um, as soon as the interrogators hear this, though, and they see the papers, they beat feet out of there. They're like, oh, we're not having anything to do with this. We're leaving. Not our problem. And so the commander, though, is still afraid because he had him bound with the intent of scourging him. So this was still a serious uh, infraction of the law for, for the uh, commander here. So... Paul's Roman citizenship here saved him from a horribly torturous interrogation and probably saved his life as well. So when Paul ends up in a Roman prison after this, here's what he's going to write to the Philippians in, in Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 17. Um, here we are. It says, brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk. You know what? This is not the right passage. I hate it when this happens. Um, okay. Well, basically, I have the passage down wrong, so we'll just have to find it. But uh, basically, the point of the passage I was hoping to share with you was that our citizenship lies in heaven and, and, and it has to do with securing us from the punishment of hell. So you and I have a citizenship that is, is far better because it spares us from eternal torture in the lake of fire and from the second death. And so when you and I are sharing our testimonies, that is the key point to our testimonies. So when we look at some application here from this passage, really what we have to go on is, is Paul sharing his testimony and how to share your testimony. So here's what we can learn from Paul. First, introduce yourself and tell a little bit about yourself when you're sharing your testimony. Tell who you were and what you were before you met Jesus. Share the details of your conversion, but make sure that Jesus stays the subject. Share how you encountered God, how you recognized your sin, and how you saw Jesus as your God and Savior. And share how you encountered, uh, how your encounter with Christ is personal to you. It's, it's your story. 
Share how you have submitted to him as the Lord of your life. Share how he has changed your life. Now, I would encourage you, if you've never done it, to write your testimony. You know, that's one of those things you can do that will, will help you not only to recount what God has done for you and in your life, but it's one of those things that can be a very powerful tool. Um, it's, it's been said that, you know, one of the most powerful weapons we have is our testimony. Now, if you write your testimony, pray about sharing it with the church at some point. Now, you know, and I know the first time I was asked to share my testimony, I was scared. It's like, I don't want, that's deeply personal. I don't want to share that. Exactly. It's, it's personal, and that's what reaches other people. Now, the, the, probably the, the, the thing that we have to keep in mind with our testimony and with this passage is, is recognizing the benefits of our citizenship. You know, that's, that's an important thing for us all, is that we understand that our citizenship lies in heaven. It's not on this earth. Yes, we're, we are... We are sojourners in this earth right now. We're just, we're just passing through and it's not for very long. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the things that just really got drilled home to me you know, last night was uh, an old friend of mine from Santa Fe passed away yesterday. I, I have a, a piece of artwork in my office he did. Um, but uh, he's just passing through in this life. He's now home. So um, I just want to encourage you guys to... Um, write your testimony, think about it, think about the guidelines I gave you there for it, because that's important. When you share your testimony, it shouldn't be as much about the horrible person you were as it is about what Jesus has done in your life and is doing in your life. So let's pray. Well, Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for um, just your many blessings for us. We do thank you for all the wonderful things you've done for us, Lord. We thank you that our citizenship is in heaven. It's not on this earth because politics change on, on an ongoing basis here, but Lord, you remain unchanged. And so, Lord, we are thankful for that. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.